Hello, everyone. Blessings to all of you who are in vertical fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So these images that we just saw were taken last summer in August downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue during these violent protests. If you are anything like me, I wonder during the time when we were watching uh, all of this happening on, on select TV stations, if there was a question going through your mind, like is there a passage or two in the New Testament that would deal with this very issue? Uh, how do we deal with this evil? Uh, what should be our stand? Well, I would like to invite you today to open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 17. There is a passage that actually not only uh, deals with this very subject, but uses the very word agitators in the same context. And uh, uh, this is one of those passages where the Apostle Paul and his companion were caught in the middle of a conflict that escalated into uh, this kind of violence. So before we uh, read the text, uh, let's ask the Father's blessing. This is a difficult subject. So let's pray that uh, the Lord will reveal many, many uh, new and good things to us through the study of His Word. Heavenly Father, we just um, humbly bow before You and pray by the power of Jesus that uh, you would open our hearts and our minds to uh, what your word has to say concerning all these things that are happening around us, all this violence and uh, all these um, protests and uh, people going into the streets and uh, doing what they are doing, all that evil that uh, we are witnessing. So, Father, I pray that um, you would not only uh, teach us, but uh, your Holy Spirit would be... Uh, the source of the of the comfort and the assurance that uh, we hope and expect to get through the study of your word and we pray this in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen and amen so before we read the passage i would like to uh, identify the players in this particular story in acts chapter 17 so we find uh, Paul and his companions in the city of Thessalonica during what we know as the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And uh, there are really four groups of people that we will be able to identify. So the first group is, is us. It's, it's God's camp, okay, represented by the Apostle Paul, by Silas, by Timothy, and, and some other companions, and also a godly man uh, named Jason, who uh, was housing the Apostles. And then on the opposite side, you have Satan's camp, the, the camp of the enemy that is represented by some of the influential Jews, not all of them, but some of them, and then also by all kinds of criminals and agitators that were recruited and no doubt hired to cause havoc in the city. And speaking of the city, the third party in this story would be uh, the, the bystanders, the onlookers, the, the people that get kind of sucked into the conflict and are inconvenienced by it. And then the fourth party, believe it or not, is the government. It's the the city council, it's the city officials, the government, the government officials that play a role in this story as well. So uh, let's uh, read the text, Acts chapter 17, verse 1, that says, Now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there, there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as it was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks 
and not a few of the leading women. Well, praise God. There was some fruit in Thessalonica. Of course, Paul and his companions planted a church. Uh, we know that later on, Paul wrote uh, two letters to the Thessalonians. And this is where it all started. So I would like to uh, raise three different questions in, in, this uh, in this particular message. And by the way, as we go through the scripture, this is not some sort of an exhaustive message or list of remedies on how to deal with violence in the streets and how to deal with these agitators. But I sure hope that uh, we're going to pick up some tools to put our into our spiritual toolbox to know how, how to uh, deal with um, all kinds of things that may arise that are not very usual because we do indeed live in unprecedented times. So three questions I want to ask. First one is what aggravates the enemies of God? Why is this happening? All right, why, why does Satan and, and his camp just kind of goes on the attack, in some cases more uh, than in other places or in other cases, and are also more violently and more, more radically? So if there is a text in Scripture that sort of lets us know about the, the real reasons or the main reasons why the enemy gets so aggravated. Acts 17 is a, is a great text. Uh, it really lays out at least four reasons for what aggravates the enemies of God. Um, so the first one is when uh, the scripture is proclaimed, when the foundation of scripture is laid out, that's really something that aggravates the enemy's camp. Uh, you see, pretty much every time there is uh, a proclamation of, of God's goodness and righteousness and of the gospel and of the moral values of God, uh, the enemy gets really panicky because that's when uh, um, the, the camps are changing, right? The dark camp begins to lose its, uh, its members and the camp of light, God's camp, begins to gain members. So that really aggravates the enemy. Uh, the scripture says in verse 2 that the apostle Paul reasoned with them from scripture. So he was laying out the, the foundation for the gospel and laying out the moral foundation of God to these Jews in the synagogue. And then the second thing that aggravates the enemy is the necessity of a savior. Remember, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the believers, the Jewish believers, believed that they can get to uh, the presence of God, to heaven, to eternity, by their own good works. And Paul reasoned with them from Scripture, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. So he was sharing with them the gospel. Right? Remember the gospel, Jesus Christ, the word incarnate, God's only son coming to this world to pay the penalty for our sins, for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world, in fact. And then as God accepted the penalty, his son had to die for these sins, uh, to be the atoning sacrifice for these sins. But because he never committed a sin himself, Ultimately, death could not hold him in the grave. And he rose on the third day and lives forevermore. And by faith, we are now accepting him as the Savior, the necessary Savior. We could not save ourselves. These Jewish believers could not save themselves by their good deeds uh, because every person has committed sins and those sins must be atoned for. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. That is the gospel. That is the good news. So the Savior... Uh, the coming of the Savior was necessary, and that's what Paul was arguing with them, proving that Jesus was the Christ. And then the third thing that would aggravate the camp of the enemy would be this exclusiveness of the gospel. Like, is that really the only way? Is that how we get to the presence of God? Yes, it is the only way. It is not the many ways, as we hear it in the Gospel of Oprah, but Jesus the scripture says, in fact, in Acts 4, that there is no other name by which, by which we must be saved. So write it down. The exclusiveness of the gospel. It is the straight and narrow way. Jesus is the way. He said it himself. I am the way in John 14. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Paul said uh, to these Jewish believers in verse 3, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. There is no other. There is no other way. And then finally, I already mentioned that, uh, the enemy gets really aggravated when he begins to lose members from his own camp, right? And begins to lose influence and control. Jot that down. The fourth reason is the loss of influence and control. Well, remember, um, the Word of God is about the values of God. It's about the character of God. It's about the moral foundation of God, right? And when the moral foundation of God is laid out and people whose heart are being regenerated by the Holy Spirit and who believe unto Christ, they then skip camp. They are brought into light out from the darkness. And that's what's happening here, a great harvest in Thessalonica. Verse 4 says, Some of them, speaking of the Jews, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. And then also great many of the devout Greeks, remember the Greeks were deists, they had many gods, but they heard the gospel and it made sense to them and their hearts were revived, so they came to Jesus. And it says also, uh, not a few of the leading women. And so there's all kinds of people coming to Christ. There is a harvest of souls and that's when the enemy gets really aggravated. So those are the four reasons. Why am I sharing that? Well, not only because <laughs> ultimately it's in the text, the scripture, that, that the Lord wants us to know these things, but also because, you see, our country, the United States of America, was, was established on the, the moral foundation of God, on the foundation of scripture. Many of the founders of our country were Christians. And uh, I tell you, I, I've traveled quite a bit and I've been in many countries and took interest in their political systems and in their government. And uh, I'm not aware of any other constitution that is out there that even mentions God. Well, our constitution does mention God as the creator. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the signers of um, the Declaration of Independence, he said that uh, our constitution is not suitable for the governance of um, any other people but moral people, God-revering people, and it's not adequate for the governance of, of any other. He also said, and I quote, God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Well, I suppose you would agree with me and with, uh, with Thomas Jefferson that the answer to his question is no. No. Um, a nation cannot be secured that in fact stops believing that these liberties are the gift of our Creator. So, darkness and uh, the goal of darkness is to actually wipe out that foundation of God, to wipe out, uh, wipe out and redefine and redirect and rewrite even history, right? To get their way and to eliminate faith because faith always, faith in Jesus Christ always provokes the enemy. And it is not the answer, especially during these times, to be less Christian, to kind of tone it down and, and to not cause trouble by being vocal about these foundations and about the proclamation of the gospel. It is not the answer. If we eliminate the gospel proclamation, we ultimately eliminate the message itself. And uh, we eliminate the hope that comes with the message. So and here is the second question. What is the purpose then? of these agitators. Well, let me define the word agitator first. The dictionary says that an agitator is a person who urges others to protest or rebel. So uh, that would be somebody that essentially goes among the people and says, hey, here is a cause and I want you to join me and we got to rebel against the government or rebel against this morality and whatever else. But we know that in the spiritual realm, the agitators that the Bible mentions are much more than just um, 
what comes out of this dictionary definition, they are in fact, listen to this very carefully, they are a channel, they become a channel to usher evil from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. All right? Let me say that one more time. These agitators are the channel by which spiritual evil gets transferred into the physical realm. So they engage in physical activities to cause public disturbance. Uh, at times they are sought out or recruited and even hired, paid for, to cause havoc and to inflict fear into the masses of people. Uh, this kind of conduct is usually uh, a part of a political movement and these professionals, if we can, <laughs> if we can call them that, uh, they don't really care who pays them or what the greater purpose is um, with these acts of violence that they are hired to perform. Because uh, for these fellows, it is um, their pleasure to cause destruction, to, uh, to uh, cause chaos, and to do violence, and to even, uh, they take pleasure in, in death. So, again, remember, their purpose is to transfer evil from spiritual realm to the physical realm, so they, in fact, become the uh, physical manifestation of the demonic powers, of the satanic um, powers. So, and Satan, as we already mentioned, uh, gets on the offensive when he begins losing followers. Um, there is real panic in the camp of the enemy. I notice that that's what happened in verses 5 through 9 as we continue in Acts 17. It says, it says but uh, the Jews were jealous. So, so jealousy was the motivation behind this. And if you remember, Satan is jealous of God. He's jealous that God is being worshipped. Satan wanted to be worshipped like God, and so that's why he rebelled against God, ultimately was cast down from heaven because of his rebellion. And uh, he then made sure that he passed this sin uh, onto humanity. Um, remember, the sin of jealousy is, um, is talked about in the Bible very early on, it is actually the second sin that after the initial fall was uh, passed on to people. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain was jealous of his brother and, uh, and so he acted on it in an evil way and you know how that worked out, right? So jealousy is the motivation. Um, the Jews were jealous because they were losing um, losing the people from the synagogue to the gospel. And it says, and taking, listen to this, taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, that is Paul and his companions, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So I wonder, with everything that we have seen uh, in our cities, in our streets, if this story sounds somewhat familiar. I mean, there are all kinds of steps that the enemy takes to transfer evil from the spiritual realm into the physical realm, right? And here is how it's done. So I want to name five things, um, it goes back to the purpose of what is the purpose of these agitators, all right? And uh, I wonder if you can notice a progression. So here's the first thing. The purpose is to mobilize wickedness. They're mobilizing wickedness. Um, verse 5 says that they took some of these wicked men of the rabble. 
um, I actually have to find out what that went, uh, what that word meant, rabble, because we don't really <laughs> use it anymore. I guess in today's context, we would say men from a gang or from the from the horde of these of these criminals, these men that were men of um, violence, and it says that they formed a mob together with them. So these were not nice guys, or they were not bright thinkers to champion the cause that the Jews wanted to represent. They were criminals. However, uh, this was a highly organized activity. You see, Satan always that does the same thing over and over, but he is a very smart celestial being, and so he's highly organized, and his camp is highly organized. And uh, we can see it throughout history. Uh, here is a quote from one of the leaders, in fact, the main leader of the uh, Soviet Revolution in uh, 1917. He said, Attention must be devoted principally to raising the workers to the level of revolutionaries. It is not our task to descend to the level of the working masses. What a co-descending statement, right? And the person who uh, spoke it was none other than Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the founder of this Marxist revolution in the Soviet Union of uh, 1917 17, that was around for the next 72 years oppressing and, and killing people and using violence to subdue uh, not only this whole country, but many other countries, including mine, uh, the former Czechoslovakia. So Satan is very organized, and uh, if you know uh, anything about these riots in Chicago and other cities that uh, you may know, they're very carefully organized, and there were these very elaborate campaigns on social media so that these agitators that came from other cities, they knew exactly what time and where to go and what to do, and so the organization was meticulous. And so the second thing, not just uh, mobilizing wickedness, but the second thing that they try to uh, do is inciting violence. Verse 5 goes on to say that they set the city in an uproar. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And they attacked the house of Jason. So they, they invaded this private, vi uh, private uh, residence of this godly man named Jason. Uh, it is almost ironic. The Bible is full of juxtapositions like that. Because Jason, his name actually means one who heals. So these this powers of darkness, they invade the household of the one who heals, who actually takes in these apostles and provides housing for them and hospitality. Um, Jason was not only a godly man, but possibly the apostle Paul's own relative. Paul actually in Romans chapter four, uh, 16, verse 21, calls him his own kinsman. So uh, one way or the other, uh, they uh, invaded his house, and then they dragged Jason and his companions, when they didn't find the apostles, in front of the city officials. And here is the third thing that they tried to uh, uh, achieve, and that is politita politi uh, politicizing, politicizing accusations. So they had some accusations they wanted to make, but they wanted to make it into a political deal to, to get these city officials rattled about those. Um, they wanted to get justice for all these non-existent issues, right? For things that never happened. That sounds familiar too. In verses 6 and 7 says, As they dragged the brothers before the city authorities, they accused them. They said, These men are acting against Caesar. They're saying that there is another king. Well, yeah, I mean, when it comes to Jesus, the, the, the king of the universe, of course there is another king. Um, so, they politicized their accusations, and they also were afflicting the multitu multitudes. That's the fourth thing. Notice verse 8 says that the people and the authorities were actually disturbed when they heard it. Okay? Um, I suppose it was not too difficult for them to succeed because every time that you have public disturbance like that and people begin shouting and bringing the government into it and, and making false accusations, it kind of grabs us, right? Uh, we kind of get a little bit insecure, like, wow, this is happening, there is violence, and there is, like, what's going to happen? What if they come to my house? And so we get concerned. And so the people got concerned, these bystanders, these onlookers, these peaceful citizens, they got concerned. And finally, 
Uh, here is another way how they uh, were translating the spiritual evil into the physical realm by inflicting punitive punishment. So they got the city officials, the government people, so rattled and so biased that they actually uh, carried out some penalties against these Christians. Now, I keep saying that, but that also sounds familiar, doesn't it? Inflicting punitive punishment by the government. Verse 9 says, they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest. Uh, well, why did they do that? Uh, obviously to make sure that this would not be happening again. They wanted to uh, control them by fear. The word uh, or the term had taken money as security is just one word in the Greek. Is the word Greek uh, hikanos that in this case uh, means like a bond, like financial bond or bail. All right. So when they exacted that bond from them, it says they let them go. So they inflicted punitive punishment on these Christians. For what? For housing these apostles that were preaching Christ? Obviously, uh, um, you can see that Satan was raising the street workers to do all these things. Look at the list again. Let me just put it up on the screen one more time. Okay, Mobilizing wickedness, inciting violence, politicizing accusations, afflicting the multitude, inflicting punitive punishment. Now, you may say, well, th 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 that's surely not happening in our country. No, it is happening in our country. It is happening in the United States of America. And it happens on our backyard every week. Uh, here in St. Louis, for example, in the Central West End, not long ago, these agitators came into the streets and they decided to target private residences. So they, they broke, they kicked down this, this fenced, uh, th this, this gate in a fenced in community and they entered in there and they were shouting their slogans and throwing things and they were armed. Some of them had weapons on them, knives and guns and, uh, and they came across the residents of, um, of uh, Mark and Patricia McCloskey. And uh, the McCloskeys were, were so afraid for their lives because these um, agitators were shouting at them. They, they, they were threatening to kill them. They were uh, threatening to kill their dog. And they were threatening to, to rape Mrs. McCloskey. And, and so they went out and they got their guns and, uh, and uh, they were ready to defend their home. And uh, here's the interesting thing. You know, the McCloskeys were later on indicted uh, because of, quote-unquote, unlawful use of weapons. Um, I mean, they were standing on their porch just holding the weapons, uh, ready to protect themselves. Thank God that it didn't come to it. But there were also nine of these agitators that were indicted. But here is the surprising part. While the McCloskeys are actually going to court and they're going to be tried, um, these agitators were actually freed. They were let go, and the, the prosecutors in the city of St. Louis decided to drop the charges. So uh, go figure. Um, so the question ought to be raised too, so when is it the right time to step up and actually fight physically, right? Because um, sometimes it may be uh, necessary, and I tell you, I, I'm not even going to pretend that I know the answer. I don't. But um, what I do know is that the physical wars are always about freedom. They are about freedom versus enslavement. I mean, uh, take the Revolutionary War in the 1770s, for example. It was um, about eliminating the uh, enslavement to the British uh, royalty and uh, the civil war in the United States 90 years later was about the enslavement of those who uh, have a different skin color. Um, world War II 80 years later was about uh, the nations being enslaved to the uh, Nazi regime in Germany and, uh, and the fall of the Soviet Union 45 years later was about 
the enslavement to the Marxism and, and atheism, to these deadly philosophies. But it always starts. It always starts with people surrendering ground of the moral and spiritual foundation, right? That, is, that comes from God. It always starts with making some surrenders and some concessions on uh, the spiritual battlefield. So how do we respond? Well, we must not get discouraged. We must, we must continue to proclaim the gospel and to, uh, to preach boldly and to assert the values that, that are in the scripture. Uh, agitators will always be hired and sent. And uh, history will always repeat itself. But um, we must not retreat. Remember, the purpose of this evil is to bring the, the spiritual evil into the physical realm. And that's why they are using all of these uh, all of these tactics that we, uh, that we explored in this passage. So here's the final question. What is the biblical way to respond? No doubt the most important question in this study. So the answer may surprise you. Remember when Jesus stood before Pilate and uh, he was... Um, ask whether he's the king and whether he's promoting this other kingdom. That's what the apostles were accused of as well. He said this, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my disciples would rise up and fight. But as it is, the kingdom of Jesus is a spiritual kingdom. It is not about the flesh, but it's about the spirit, right? Think about it. If we fight in the spiritual realm, that's where the hearts of those who hear the gospel are touched and then, and then transformed and they become believers. And so Satan loses people from his camp. They come to the camp of God. They come into the light. They're called by the Holy Spirit. They're given the Holy Spirit and they become believers. And so ultimately uh, they become a part of the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ. So, so how do we respond? Number one, redirect the mission. What do I mean by that? Verse 10 says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So, yeah, that may surprise us. But in the reaction to what was happening, as the, uh, the spiritual evil was being translated into the physical realm, the brothers, the disciples, the Christians said, okay, this is it. Two dangers. It's, it's, this is not our mission anymore. We have to redirect the mission. We are not supposed to go and fight these agitators. We're not supposed to go there and, and, and pick up some weapons and just go and, and violence for violence. That is the Old Testament, eye for an eye, right? But Jesus said, but I say to you. And when he said that, he already in his holy mind, had the picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ being poured out by the power of the Holy Spirit so that people can come into peace with God and ultimately embrace that peace and renounce violence. That's how we're going to win this battle, that people come to Christ and ultimately will give up physical ways of violence and anarchy. So um, Satan's objective is change the fight. Christian objective is change it back. <laughs> uh, redirect the message. This Paul and Silas were the leaders, right? They were the apostles. They were the shepherds. They were the movement leaders that just came into that synagogue initially in Thessalonica. And so, if you know anything about battle strategy, ultimately, um, you've heard that said: take out the leaders, and the movement will cease, right? Or the the army will fall apart. Jesus himself in Matthew 26 verse 31 quoted to the disciples uh, the Old Testament from Zechariah 13 and he said, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. You know, the disciples tried to convince him Peter, right? Like, Lord, this cannot happen to you. And, uh, can, like, and, and he said, listen, all of you fall away. 
because tonight God's going to strike the shepherd. And so the result of that is that the sheep will scatter. And so the disciples didn't want that to happen. So they go like, Paul, Silas, let's go. So they send them by night to Berea, all right, neighboring city. Um, and what were they doing there? Well, that's the second thing. They were looking for the good soil because the soil into which the seeds of the gospel were being planted was no longer any good in Thessalonica, all right? The gospel came out, people got saved, and then it got bad. So they redirected the mission looking for the good soil. So write this down. Find the good soil. Uh, verse 11 and 12 says that when they got to Berea, they went to the synagogue. You know, it was Paul's custom. And it says, listen to this. Now, these Jews in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Um, you may have a different translation that says they were of more noble character than those uh, in Thessalonica. They received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, it says, believed, and again, with not a few Greek women uh, and men, it says, of high standing. So there was a great harvest again in Berea. But what was the difference? Well, the difference was the soil. It was the hearts of these believers that, that have this noble character. They wanted the Word of God. They wanted to examine it. They went home and they were studying the Scripture. They were studying their scrolls. And it's like, wow! What, what Paul and Silas are saying, it is true, it is Jesus, it is the Christ. Wow, Isaiah 53 says that. And whatever they were saying, I mean, they saw it. And God was enabling them. And so there was this great harvest. The difference was the soil of their heart. Why am I speaking about the soil? This may surprise you. This may be the second surprise in uh, answering the third question here. Because um, not everyone the Bible teaches, is even worthy of the gospel. Do you remember the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8? Jesus gave that parable for a purpose. And he said that as the sower goes out to sow the seed, to give a recap, some of the seed that he was planting, which was the word of God, fell along the path. And the birds came and picked it, and it was gone, and then some of it fell fell into this rocky soil, never took any root. And, and, and then some of it fell among the thorns and thistles, the, the, the weeds, and, and they choked it. But some of it, Jesus said, fell into the good soil. And that's the kind of soil that we see in, in Berea, these people that had the character, that had the nobility in their, in their heart to allow the Word of God to sink in and then go home and, and examine that and like, wow, it is true. All right? The difference was the soil. So find a good soil. That is the second part. That is the way that we ought to deal with all of this. Um, don't share the gospel with people who are foolish, who don't want to hear it. Um, the scripture actually says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9, Don't speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, puts it this way. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Isn't that what was happening in Thessalonica? They turned and began attacking, and they were trampling on the pearl of the gospel. In fact, Jesus later on described the gospel as a precious pearl that is found by somebody, right? And so rather than telling everybody, look what I have found, they turned like the pigs, like the swine, like, like these unclean animals that are named by Jesus, and they attacked. And then finally, the third thing is repeat as necessary. So I'm not suggesting that we run at the first sign of trouble, right? On the contrary. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 3, in verse 15 and 16, we read these words, Always be prepared, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason, 
for the hope that is in you. Yet, listen to this, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put. Why repeat as necessary? Well, because when we look at um, verses 13 and 14, that's actually exactly what happened. Verse, 10, uh, verse 13 says that when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too. So these agitators, they moved from one city to another. Well, that's what's happening to us now. Um, so they came there too, agitating. Here is the word, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And here is what the brothers did. Here you have it again. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. So Silas and Timothy stayed to tidy it up a little bit with these new believers as, as they were ultimately planting a church, right, of these new believers. And those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and there was another further ground, if you read on in Acts 17. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy, eventually Silas and Timothy joined him in Athens, but uh, repeat as necessary is there. They did exactly the same thing. They not only redirected the mission, they found the good soil in Berea, and so eventually moving on to Athens to find some more good soil, and they repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as necessary because uh, the gospel stirs up opposition. It will always happen. The values of God. The, the, the moral foundation of God, the scripture, the goodness, the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, it will always stir up opposition. And even the agitators, even the street workers of Satan. But um, the reason we fight the spiritual war is to minimize this physical conflict. And that's what we do. Our task, remember, is... To go on, to bring the spiritual foundation that ultimately subdues the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, to bring the spiritual foundation into the lives of all people. And listen, we know that all kinds of wicked men, all kinds of agitators and anarchists and jailbirds got converted. They left the past behind and embraced the life-saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're hearing from one of them. And I praise God that uh, when I was 24 years old, that somebody who actually came from very, very difficult conditions, from, from multiple prison sentences and all kinds of agitated situations, was a Christian who gave me the Bible that uh, eventually made all the difference in my life as the Lord Jesus Christ made me to be one of his followers. So praise God for that. Let's pray. Let's thank God for making it clear to us why we are here. And uh, by God's grace and by his power, I hope that that's exactly what you will set out to do, to bring the spiritual foundations, the scripture, the moral values of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, away from the physical, into the spiritual hearts of the people around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us through this message. Thank you for making it clear that Satan wants to bring the spiritual things into the physical and destroy, to kill, to, to devour. We know what he's after. And so, Lord, we say, help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, to do exactly the opposite, that we take... The, uh, the, the physicality of this battle and bring it right back into the spiritual realm, proclaiming the word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the goodness and the righteousness and, and the moral foundation of our God to those who are desperate. Lord, we know that there's so many, I mean, all of us, we were once uh, wicked and we were once lost. And uh, we have the experience of, of knowing what the light of God can do in our lives. So I pray, Father, that we would set out 
to be like these early missionaries in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul and his companions, to, uh, to move from place to place as we need to, from city to city, and never stop until Jesus Christ comes back to claim us as his own. Never stop proclaiming the good news of the gospel. That is our response. And by the power of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pledge ourselves to you in this mission. Amen. My friends, may the Lord stir up your heart to go out there and proclaim his gospel to the lost. That is the answer. That is our mission. And remember, as you go out there, you are loved.